All right. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you all enjoyed the wonderful music um, that you heard while you were waiting. I know I did as well. I'd like to thank you all for attending Suffolk DSA's teaching about fascism on Long Island presented by our political education committee. We have a very informative and illuminating presentation for you today, but before we begin proper, let's get a few formalities out of the way. A quick reminder to those of you who may be hard of hearing that you can enable subtitles by clicking live transcript located on the bottom of your screen. Um, now with that out of the way, first off, we'll begin by introducing our panelists for today. And they are as follows, Han, they, them, Charles, he, him, Tim, he, him, Joe, he, him, and your MC for today, myself. And my name is Freya, she, her. Um, next, we like to give you some content warnings about what you'll be seeing in this presentation. So due to the nature of the subject at hand, we will be discussing topics such as white supremacy, anti-Semitism, the Holocaust, ableism, trans hostility, and sexual assault. Uh, we will be mentioning some of the processes of the Holocaust when it's relevant, but because this isn't a presentation specifically about that, we won't be displaying any graphic representation of it. So that's not something you have to worry about. Uh, we will be showing you a video of a, a Nazi rally in Madison Square Garden in 1939. And for about one minute during the video, there will be discernible physical violence in the form of punches being thrown. And this is the only instance of such violence that will be shown to you throughout the course of the presentation. Before these instances come up, the speakers will be repeating these trigger and content warnings. Um, and of course, we encourage you to put your comfort and well being first. And should you find those being compromised, you are more than welcome to step away for a moment and recollect yourself. One last disclaimer, uh, we have been researching for this teaching for months now, and our goal is to provide you with the most accurate and factual information possible, a goal we believe we have achieved in this presentation. Should there be any errors, we take full accountability for them. Our sources, along with some further reading, will be provided to you at the end. Now, with all the disclaimers out of the way, let's go over our program for today. Our first segment, Black Shirts uh, and Brown Shirts, Tim and Charles's introduction to fascism's foundation in Europe during the tumultuous interwar period. This will give us the context crucial to understanding how fascism, especially Nazism, is exported to the United States. This is what Han will be examining in further detail in the second segment, Meanwhile in America, going over specific instances in New Jersey, Madison Square Garden in New York City, and Yaping's forgotten Nazi youth camp, Camp Siegfried. Coming back to the here and now, Joe and Tim will analyze and uncover the fascism of today, its modern lexicon and aesthetics, and its harbingers here on Long Island. Now, without any further delay, let's begin with black shirts and brown shirts. Tim, the floor is yours. Thank you, Brenna. Hi, everyone. I'm Tim, he, him. In this section, we're giving some historical context, talking about the origins of fascism in Italy and Germany before it was exported to the US. To start us off with that, Charles is going to situate us in a time before fascism with this epigraph. Hello all, I'm Charles, he, him. This is from Frederick Engels in 1895. If the socialist vote continues in this fashion, by the end of this century, we shall conquer the major middle section of society, petty bourgeois and peasants, and grow into the decisive power in the land. Revolutionaries are thriving far better on legal methods than revolt. The parties of order are perishing under the legal conditions created by themselves. If we are not so crazy as to let ourselves be driven into street fighting in order to please them, then there is nothing left for them but to break through this legality so fatal to them. Thank you, Charles. Friedrich Engels, of course, was the working partner of Karl Marx. Together, they were the founders of scientific socialism. 
And Engels writes this in the final year of his life at a time when more and more people were taking part in the political process. And when socialists were the only organizers in town for the working class. For a long time, if you were angry about politics in Europe, you were a socialist. It took some time for conservatives to learn how to appeal to regular people. That changed in the aftermath of World War I and with the emergence of the mass society. Here, Engels is saying just that, that conservatives will have to begin organizing the working and middle classes, which they had never done before if they hoped to defeat socialism. And in 1895, that possibility probably seemed wildly unlikely, but it's exactly what happened. Fascism took many by surprise and many people became black shirts and brown shirts, joining the fascist parties in Italy and Nazi Germany. So what is fascism, Charles? That's a difficult question to answer, Tim, because fascist thought and action differ to a considerable extent. While Benito Mussolini, who we'll meet on the next slide, was Italy's undisputed ruler, he did have to work with King Emmanuel and Pope Pius XI for the entirety of his reign. His main targets were socialists, labor unions, and the media. So in Italy, fascist power infringed less on traditional power. Whereas in Germany, Hitler had the opposite experience. So while, it, while Italy stagnated after its 1936 invasion of Ethiopia, Nazi Germany, of course, radicalized to the point of the Holocaust. So is fascism undefinable? While settling on a definition isn't our objective in this presentation, we would be remiss not to entertain a few different definitions. All right, first up is Il Duce, the prime minister of fascist Italy himself, Benito Mussolini. And Freya is going to pop in and read these definitions. Freya? Fascism is everything within the state, nothing against the state, nothing outside the state. It is a religious conception in which man is seen in his imminent relationship with a superior law and an objective will that transcends the particular individual and raises him to a conscious relationship with a spiritual society. Whoever has seen in the religious politics of the fascist regime, nothing but mere opportunism has not understood that fascism, besides being a system of government, is also, and above all, a system of thought. If that sounds kind of like a word salad, Mussolini is basically saying here that fascism is a death cult for the needs of the nation state. Well, hold on there, Charles. Don't forget that it's not just the state, it's a system of government and a system of thought. Huh. Yeah, if you still think that's kind of a word salad, you are right. It's a real galaxy brain take. Next up, we have George Jackson, the noted prison radical and revolutionary. Freya? At its core, fascism is an economic rearrangement. It is international capitalism's response to the challenge of international scientific socialism. It is simply an arrangement of an established capitalist economy, an attempt to renew, perpetuate, and legitimize that economy's rulers. Fascism must be seen as an episodically logical stage in the socioeconomic development of capitalism in a stage of crisis. The ultimate aim of fascism is the complete destruction of all revolutionary consciousness. Jackson distills the Marxist definition pretty well here. Fascism is a continuation of class warfare when the capitalists appear to be losing. And its goal is to destroy the political left. Finally, we have Robert Paxton, a Columbia University history professor. Fascism may be defined as a form of political behavior marked by obsessive preoccupation with community decline, humiliation, or victimhood 
and by compensatory cults of unity, energy, and purity, in which a mass-based party of committed nationalist militants working in uneasy but effective collaboration with traditional elites abandons democratic liberties and pursues with redemptive violence and without ethical or legal restraints goals of internal cleansing and external expansion. This is more of a liberal take, but gosh darn it if it's not a very pretty sentence. Paxton argues that fascism is a racist, violent, anti-democratic and expansive kind of nationalism. And he emphasizes that it requires complicity from the masses and alliances with conservatives. It doesn't just happen. So we'd like to know how these definitions resonated with you, knowing there's no right or wrong answer to which one is the most accurate. Is it Mussolini's, a death cult for the needs of the state? Is it Jackson's, a continuation of class warfare to destroy the left? Or is it Paxton's, a racist, violent, anti-democratic and expansive nationalism with alliances? We'll give you 30 seconds to answer the poll. And the winner is, it's all of the above. Okay, so why fascism? Why was it possible and why was it successful? The first reason is World War I. World War I is supposed to be short when it starts in 1914, but then nearly all of Europe gets involved, the US enters, the Russian Revolution terrifies everyone. And at the end in 1918, the death toll is about 20 million people all told. So optimistic and progressive views of the future are discredited to some extent. And at the end of the war, the Treaty of Versailles shorts Italy some territories that it was promised by other countries. And Germany is blamed for the war and forced to pay the cost in a devastating reparations arrangement. Many German soldiers and people on the home front don't see it coming and they come to believe that German defeat is the result of a plot by socialists and Jews. And the second reason is going back to the Engels epigraph, the mass society, by which we mean people gaining voting rights, joining political parties, and reading newspapers and absorbing advertising and propaganda and becoming consumers. Social divisions are profound and fascism is the first conservative movement to capitalize on that, as anti-politics attracts conservative middle classes and alienated workers. This is Berlin, Germany, at the turn of the century in 1900. We can see transportation, people are walking about, you know, we recognize the architecture as a city. We can assume people are literate and have hobbies. We just wanted to illustrate the mass society here. And this is an infamous political cartoon illustrating a German soldier being stabbed in the back by a socialist decked out in red with a mask on. This is the myth that loomed large in the minds of a lot of German people after World War I. But why did it gain traction? The first answer is the failure of liberal democracies. Wartime command economies resulted in serious unemployment problems. We've got some pictures of German inflation on the next slide. But social tensions and the threat of social revolutions are in the air, and a fair amount of the people had no experience with civil responsibility as mass politics becomes normalized. There was no common ground or clear majority power. When it came down to it, conservatives faced with the choice went with the allure of fascism. And we also have the failures of socialism. The revolution was considered to have been compromised by the corrupting influence of power. And there was also no united front. The socialists in fact actually expected a Nazi coup. In the end, socialism was believed to be a failure. Fascism had solutions. Right here, 
we see just how useless German money was considered by its citizens due to inflation. Imagine an average person doing this today here, even with inflation having persisted like it has. The stage was set for the people to want to listen to anyone who would offer what they felt would be a positive change. And we have to address the anti-Semitic and racist elements of fascism. In Europe as a whole, but specifically in Germany, anti-Semitism was rampant well before World War I. And after the war, Jews were a major culprit of the stab in the back conspiracy. Hitler had an obsessive hatred of Jews that is evident in the first Nazi party program, which we'll see in a second. But that hatred radicalizes to the part to the point of the Holocaust. Street violence and terror are selective up until 1933 when Hitler becomes Chancellor of Germany. But they're selective until they become institutionalized. Jews are removed from civil society. Businesses are boycotted by the government and destroyed. They're stripped of citizenship and then segregated and 10 million people, 6 million of them Jews, are exterminated in the Nazi concentration camps. In contrast, racism was not a core tenet of early fascist thought in Italy. While Mussolini pursued vendettas against Slavic neighbors, he did not emphasize race and even wrote of disdain for racism in early thoughts. Race does not come to the forefront of Italian fascist thought until the release of the 1938 Manifesto on Race, in which it is written, the time has come for Italians to openly declare themselves racist. It's thought that the manifesto was released as an attempt to draw closer to their allies in Nazi Germany. This is the original program of the National Socialist German Workers Party or Nazi Party the 25 points in the original German. Socialist is added to the party name to lure in left-wing sympathizers. Hitler actually objects to it being included, but he is overruled. Um, the program is kind of a mishmash though of demands. It calls for the unification of all ethnic Germans within Germany. It wants to cancel the Treaty of Versailles. It says that Jewish people aren't real Germans, that sort of thing. And as incoherent as it might be, it gains some traction with the discontented and puts enemies on notice. So who are the enemies of fascism? Let's start with the socialists, Jews, and Judeo-Bolshevism. With the emphasis socialist place on class revolution and the support of internationalism, fascists naturally saw socialists as their foes. The fascist belief in survival of the fittest and the superiority of the state placed it at odds with socialist thought. The Nazis saw socialists and Jews as the same thing, hence the term Judeo-Bolshevism, the Bolsheviks being the party of the Russian Revolution. Moving on, fascists had no love for classical liberalism either. Beyond believing that liberalism enabled social, socialists, they also believed that the liberals' belief in free speech made them weak, and they were opposed to the idea of individualism that was found in classical liberalism. Finally, anyone they considered as other was also considered to be an enemy. The likes of anti-nationals, the disabled, homosexuals, and many more were labeled as useless mouths. Here we have a crowd of thousands gathering to hear Mussolini speak at the Roman Forum on April 12th, 1934. We can see the sway Mussolini held over the masses. And this is a Nazi black shirts rally. That banner translates from the German meaning death to Marxism. We begin the rise to power in Italy. In 1919, Mussolini founds the Fasci di Cabadimento, a platform in which the early foundations of fascism are codified. Some of the platforms would be considered populist 
especially by the standards of the era, such as an eight hour workday and a progressive tax. But these were mixed with more familiar platforms of fascism, such as submission to the state, which was always at the forefront for Mussolini. In 1920, there were a wave of strikes by militant industrial workers, which the fascists took advantage of by allying with business and attacking workers in the name of maintaining order. The 1921 elections then saw 35 fascists elected to parliament, including Mussolini himself. Around the same time as World War I ends, Hitler is still a corporal in the army and the German Workers' Party draws the attention of the German army. So Hitler infiltrates the party for army intelligence, but he comes to find that they are brutal anti-Semites just like he is. And he joins and he discovers that he has some gift for public speaking. He helps turn the German Workers' Party into the Nazi party in 1920 and publishes the party program, which we saw. The party is still pretty fringe at this time and inspired by Mussolini's March on Rome, Hitler stages a coup in 1923 at a beer hall, which comes to be known as the Beer Hall Putsch. And it fails and he goes to prison for a short period. While he is banned uh, from speaking in public at this time, he is able to publish his memoir, Mein Kampf in 1925. And Mein Kampf translates to my struggle. That retains his audience and he vows electoral victory. Here we have the March on Rome in October, 1922. Of note, many early fascists were disaffected war veterans. Thanks to the Russian revolution, fear of socialist revolution was huge. Thus, the fascists were seen as anti-Bolshevik heroes. In Po Valley, which is at the top of Italy and where Mussolini's black shirts first took hold, socialists were in power and workers in the farms there won big gains and there was no power for landowners to turn to. No one was fighting the socialists until the fascists were and that gained a lot of traction. This is a picture of a German beer hall during a Nazi rally. Beer halls were exceptionally good recruiting grounds for Nazis because downtrodden people could get free beer and be introduced to Nazism in a friendly manner. And I just wanna to note too that skipping ahead to the present day, there are some parallels uh, between the beer hall putsch and the January 6th Capitol siege uh, to be kept in mind. Back to Italy. In 1921, Mussolini founds the National Fascist Party, which was rooted in Italian nationalism and expansionism, as well as a corporatist economic system and accommodation of the political right. In August, 1922, a general strike was called by the socialists. This call ends in failure, in part due to disruption by the fascists. This culminates in the previously mentioned March on Rome in October, 1922, which ends with Mussolini being declared the prime minister. Mussolini continued to garner power and would declare his dictatorship in 1925. In Germany, Hitler is not in prison very long. In 1927, his public speaking ban is lifted but the 1928 election is not successful for the Nazis. They win only about 2.5% of the federal elections that year. But then in 1930, as the Great Depression comes to Germany, Hitler seizes the opportunity and blames Jews. Socialists are divided, there's mass unemployment, and Hitler says that there are no economic problems or economic solutions just political problems and political solutions. To the quarter of the population that had never voted before, that kind of rhetoric is very effective. He calls out the weaknesses of the German government and does pretty well. The Nazis get about 18% of the seats in 1930. And by 1932, as the depression deepens, the Nazis become the largest political party in Germany. 
they never get a majority until other parties are outlawed, but they are able to convince conservatives that they are more reasonable than the socialists. And uneasy but definite alliances with conservatives are formed. And in 1933, of course, Hitler becomes the chancellor of Germany. The rest, as they say, is beyond the scope of this presentation. Hi, everyone. Again, my name is Han, and my pronouns are they, them. So now we're going to shift our focus from Europe back to the United States. In brief, how Europe, European fascism was exported abroad. The fascist group that I will focus on is the German American Bund. I'm going to show you a video from World War II historian Mark Felton to give you more context about the German American Bund. This video does show Nazi imagery and contains anti Semitic speech. The clip is about four minutes long, so feel free to step away and come back if you do not want to see or hear that. Throughout the 1920s and 30s, as the popularity of Adolf Hitler and the Nazi Party grew, copycat organizations sprang up all over Europe, some of them actively supported by the Nazi Party in Germany, many based among the German communities outside the Reich. In Austria, a huge Nazi Party grew in the 1920s and was an important force in creating the Anschluss, the union with Germany that took place in 1938. In the Sudetenland, the German-speaking parts of Czechoslovakia, there was Konrad Henlein and the Sudeten German Home Front, which agitated for union with Germany. Other Nazi-type parties were not made up of Germans, but instead homegrown ultra-nationalist organisations. In Britain, there was the British Union of Fascists, led by the charismatic former British government minister Sir Oswald Mosley, which grew to a peak membership of around 50,000 followers in the mid-1930s. There were, of course, many others. The United States, which had a large proportion of the population claiming descent from German immigrants, was no less susceptible to the attractions of Hitler and Nazism during the tumultuous period of the Great Depression and isolationist 1930s. The first overtly American Nazi organization was the rather harmless-sounding Friends of New Germany, founded in May 1933 after Deputy Führer Rudolf Hess had given his permission to Nazi Party member and U.S. immigrant Heinz Spannknöbel. Spannknöbel was a minister in the Seventh-day Adventist Church and worked for the Ford Motor Company. With the assistance of the German consul in New York City, Spannknöbel formed the Friends, headquartered at Yorkville, Manhattan. Openly anti-Semitic, the organization organized boycotts of Jewish-owned businesses in Yorkville and stirred up general trouble in New York. Spannknöbel was deported in October 1933. He was later arrested by the Soviet NKVD in Germany in 1945 and died of starvation in a special camp in March 1947. The US government began to investigate and monitor Nazi activities in America, but the Friends of New Germany never amounted to more than 10,000 members. It was wound up on Rudolf Hess's explicit orders in December 1935. A new organization was founded in Buffalo, New York in March 1936, the German-American Bund. The leader was a former World War I German soldier and Nazi Party member, Fritz Kuhn, who had emigrated to the United States. In order to expand its message and membership, the German-American Bund followed the Nazi practice of subdividing the nation, each section having its own party subdivision. In this way, the party spread right across the U.S., from coast to coast. Headquarters was at 178 East 85th Street in Manhattan, New York. The Bund's belief system was anti-communist, anti-Jewish, and pro-American, and also demanded that the U.S. remain neutral in any coming European war. Membership was around 25,000 fee-paying members in 1938. However, it never garnered widespread appeal among Americans, remained a fringe organization that managed to pull off some high-profile stunts. The Bund was well organized and had training camps where recruits could be fully indoctrinated into National Socialist thought and practice. 
and these were built all over the U.S., including in Wisconsin, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and New York State. So I want to highlight some of the points Mark Felton makes in this video. First, the economic conditions at the time these fascist groups were rising in popularity. Remember from our discussion of European fascism that in Europe, the economic hardship people faced made them susceptible to recruitment by these groups. The persecution felt by Germans in Germany had a ripple effect on some German American immigrants. Many of them still had family abroad. Whether the persecution was imagined or real, it was certainly felt and people were motivated to join a group that made them feel superior, powerful, and accepted. Second, the global aspect of it. These groups were highly organized and their coalitions crossed borders as well as oceans. While many of these movements had small numbers in their countries, when you look at the global scope of it, the movement is much bigger. Third, for the Bund, their anti-Semitism and their anti-communism are completely connected. Many fascists believed and still believe today that Jewish people were the ones who created, pushed and organized for socialism, communism, all of these ideologies linked to Marxism. Finally, the insistence from the German American Bund on US neutrality when it came to World War II. The rest of that video goes on to talk about the local chapters of the Bund and the rally they hosted at Madison Square Garden. The rally took place on February 20th, 1939 at Madison Square Garden. Over 20,000 people attended. The city prepared by fortifying the area with police officers per the orders of Mayor LaGuardia. This event had the highest number of officers dispatched out of any event in the city's history prior or since. You can see in the photograph on the right, a police officer pulling a US flag from the hands of an anti-fascist protester. As you might imagine, this event was unpopular with many New York City residents and there were protests organized by Jewish, socialist and other anti-fascist groups. There were 100,000 anti-fascist protesters gathered outside the arena carrying anti-Hitler and anti-Nazi signs. One person's sign, the topmost sign if you're looking at the photograph, says down with LaGuardia's defense of fascists. People were angry the city even let this event take place. We are going to show you a documentary of archival footage from that night called A Night at the Garden, which is directed and edited by Marshall Curry. In the video, you will see one of the protesters, Isidore Greenbaum, get up on stage to disrupt the speech of the leader of the German American Bund, Fritz Kuhn. Greenbaum is then attacked by the Nazis on stage and roughly carried out of the stadium by several police officers. A warning about the following video. The upcoming video contains Nazi symbolism, as well as physical violence and white supremacist and anti-Semitic anti speech. Please take care of yourselves and don't feel like you have to stay and watch if you do not want to. The video is about six minutes long. So now we will start the video. So if you want to skip it, now's the time to step away. On 
undivided allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and the Republic for which it stands, one nation indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Ladies and gentlemen, fellow Americans, American patriots, I'm sure I do not come before you tonight as a complete stranger. You all have heard of me through the Jewish controlled press as a creature with horns, a cloven hoof, and a long tail. We, with American ideals, demand that our government shall be returned to the American people who founded it. If you ask what we are actively fighting for under our charter, first, a social trust white Gentile who rules the United States. Second, Gentile-controlled labor union, free from Jewish Moscow-directed domination. So that was certainly a grim video, a given considering the subject matter. For the sake of self-care and maintaining a sound mind, better position to learn, we're going to take a short break during which we'll play some music for you. Please take the time to recollect your thoughts and regain your composure. We'll see you here when we return. Welcome back, everyone. I hope that time was helpful for regrounding yourselves as the rest of the presentation will be emotionally heavy as well. 
Um, really quickly, I just wanted to make sure you're all aware we do have the Q&A feature open. Um, if you have questions as we go along, you can put them in there and our chat moderators will collect them and save them all for the end for us. So now I want to talk more in detail about the Long Island chapter of the German American Bund, <coughs> excuse me, who owned and operated a summer camp in Yaping called Camp Siegfried. So I've lived on Long Island nearly my whole life and I had never heard of Camp Siegfried until about a year ago. I'm curious to know how widespread this blank spot is. So please answer in the poll that will pop up now. Okay, so we have um, pretty much a 50-50 of the people who do live on Long Island who've heard of it and who've not. So Camp Siegfried was started in 1935. This was the welcome sign that you would see if you entered the camp. You can see the person on the right is wearing a Nazi armband. Many signs around the camp and some in the surrounding town of Yapink were written in German like this one is. The German American Bund advertised for Camp Siegfried to German Americans in the New York City metro area by sending a letter in 1936. The letter includes many dog whistles and I think is worth analyzing to see how fascists code their true intentions and messages. For anyone unfamiliar with the term dog whistle, it refers to coded language in political messaging that is meant to signal to one particular group subtly to avoid controversy. It is often used by bigots to signal bigotry to their supporters in a way that protects them from criticism. Freya, would you read this quote, please? When the weekend approaches, we are just longing to leave the pavements, the crowded thoroughfares, the dust, the noise of the city behind us to find peace and health, restoring recreation at some quiet retreat among people whose friendship we treasure. Camp Siegfried is just that. It will remind you of those beautiful summer excursions in the old homeland. Thank you, Freya. As I mentioned earlier, some German Americans felt they were being persecuted due to their German heritage. The message in the subtext here is leave the dirty city crowded with people. And most importantly, people who are not white German Christians, people who are not like you and come out to the spacious, beautiful countryside where you can be with people like you or people who are white German Christians. This rhetoric may sound familiar if you listen to present day white nationalists and supremacists like Tucker Carlson, for example. It sounds like racist and anti-Semitic conspiracies like the replacement theory that Carlson is pushing these days. Okay, so this is from the same letter which is signed by Ernst Müller, who was the president of the German American Settlement League or the GASL until he joined the Bund. The GASL was another group that supported Hitler and his rise in Germany. Müller worked on a lot of the Bund's promotional campaigns. Would you read this quote please, Freya? You will not regret a weekend excursion to Camp Siegfried, for at the camp you will meet people who think as you do, cheerful people, honest and sincere, law-abiding. There are no military barracks, field pieces, and other things mentioned in the newspapers. Thank you. So again, the Bund's messaging is focused on this desire of people to be with people just like them. Their goal is to reach disaffected German Americans who feel they can only find camaraderie among other German people. This line about sincere law abiding people is a dog whistle meant to make people think about the people the Bund thought were not honest, not law abiding. So that's black people, Jewish people, queer people, people of color, indigenous people, basically anyone who's not a non-disabled white German Christian. The final line is a diss to the press. There were many newspapers in New York City who were, at the time, reporting on the Nazi camp that was holding military trainings out in Yapink, Long Island. This is also a nod to the anti-Semitic conspiracy that the media is controlled by Jewish communists. 
which you heard Fritz Kuhn mention earlier in A Night at the Garden. The next slide we see will contain Nazi symbols, so please take a breath if you need. I'm sure you noticed in the quotes from the letter that there were no explicit mentions of Hitler or Nazi ideology. But once people arrived, many of them by taking the Camp Siegfried special, an LIRR route that ran on Sundays from Flatbush Avenue, Penn Station, and Jamaica, the scene in this photograph is what greeted them. People reading that advertisement who were interested in spending their weekend fraternizing with Nazis understood the message the Bund laid out to them without them being explicit. So what was going on at the camp? First, they had to build the camp. Campers constructed all of the structures themselves. They would also do stump speeches, petitions, ballot signature gathering for fascist approved candidates like Congressman William Lemke and Alf London, who both had presidential runs in 1936. There were also more traditional summer camp activities like music and dancing. There was a miniature carousel of costume dancers, which performed in cuckoo clock fashion to polka music. There were also appearances from famous musicians like Bing Crosby, who performed at Camp Siegfried. So one of the things I remember most from my history class on Nazi Germany in public school was the Hitler Youth Programs, where they would begin to indoctrinate kids into Nazi ideology as early as possible. The German-American Bund used the same technique here in the US, and children were not exempt from camp activities. They also did labor. They were responsible for constructing the children's structures. They were also forced to learn Nazi ideology and Aryan philosophy. If their parents complained about any of this, the parents were reprimanded by camp leadership. And abuses went even further, and some camp leaders sexually assaulted some of the children. Three of these children did serve time for espionage, while others became members of the US Armed Forces in World War II. What did the town think about the Nazi camp in their backyard? The community did not have a problem with the camp when it first opened in 1935, despite its ties to Nazi Germany. Although this sentiment shifted to be more negative once the US became involved in World War II. The business community of Brookhaven and the neighboring townships welcomed the camps and the visitors as well. Town residents were known to regard the parades held by the Bund as good Sunday fun. This photograph is an example of one of the parades the Bund would hold. As you can see, there is both a Nazi flag and a United States flag. The people holding the flags appear to me to be children. This parade is on Main Street in Yapping, I believe, and parades like it were held in towns across Long Island while the Bund was active here. Young people of Yapping were frustrated with the Nazi activities at Camp Siegfried and would vandalize campgrounds on occasion and help identify camp attendees and give this information to the FBI. Donald Voorhees, an especially anti-Nazi youth, slashed Nazi tires and dug up their swastika garden. This is a photograph of the swastika garden that Donald Voorhees dug up. The local police were called and he was forced to apologize and replant the garden. However, the children did not replant the garden in the shape of a swastika. The anti-fascist youth also delayed the camp's ability to set up modern plumbing by shooting their water tank when the Nazis left it lying on the ground near the road. Before I go into the government's response to the camp, I want to briefly bring us over to New Jersey to talk about Camp Siegfried's sister camp, Camp Nordland. This camp was also owned and operated by the German American Bund. On August 18, 1939, they hosted an Americanism rally here and invited a local chapter of the Ku Klux Klan. Officially, the KKK was opposed to the German American Bund because they saw their pro Hitler sentiment as anti American. However, there were many hateful ideologies that the two groups held in common. 
This KKK chapter saw the rally as a good opportunity to make money and build membership. The KKK was very active on Long Island during this time, and they still have a presence here today. At the height of the local KKK presence, one in seven people living on Long Island were members. The collaboration between these two groups triggered a HUAC, or the House for Un-American Activities Committee, investigation. So we had Nazis organizing out in the open in Yapank, Long Island. What was the government, both local and federal, doing about it? The FBI was interested in Nazi activity on Long Island because of a weapons manufacturing plant that was right across the Sound in Bridgeport, Connecticut. So, so there were multiple investigations into camp attendees conducted by the FBI. There was also a local trial of the Riverhead Six, prominent camp leadership. The prosecutors aimed to take down the Bund by proving that the organization had members pledge an oath to Nazi Germany. The members who took the stand stayed firm in their account that there was no oath required to join and that they were all good US citizens. However, the jury was turned against them when a camp attendee named Wunderlich hiled in the courtroom. Wunderlich claimed he only saluted the US flag, not the Nazi flag. And when the prosecutor asked him how he saluted the flag, he stood up and showed the court his Nazi salute. These members of the Bund faced some jail time and some fines. Once World War II was in full swing, the federal government turned up the heat and many of these Nazis were interned or expelled. So what's expulsion? This often meant relocation to the Midwest or the center of the country. The Midwest was not as occupied by settlers as the East Coast at the time, but there were absolutely indigenous people living there. There were many nations there, but a few of the largest were the Sioux, Blackfeet, and Ojibwe nations. It's hard to know exactly where these Nazis were expelled to, at least from the sources I've read. Uh, so it's also hard to know whose land they were encouraged to steal. And if anyone has any resources for where I can learn more about that, please share them with me. I do encourage you, especially um, if you're a settler like I am, to think about the implications of the US government sending people that they know are Nazis to relocate alongside indigenous people. Um, if you're not already aware, Nazis are very anti-indigenous. They believe wholeheartedly in the project of settler colonialism. So the WRA provided transportation, housing, monetary and employment assistance to those excluded and allowed them within limits to select new sites. The WRA is the War Relocation Authority, the government organization responsible for carrying out these expulsions. They did not drop these Nazis off in the middle of nowhere and tell them good luck. They helped them, provided them with financial support so they could restart their lives with relative ease. Okay, so they were picked up and moved to the Midwest, but where did they go? It seems to me that many Nazis were allowed to reintegrate into society without having to change their ideology and faced few consequences for spreading it. This Nazi you see here on the left is named August Klaproth. He was a Fuhrer of the German American Bund and the head of the chapter that led Camp Nordland. I don't know the details of the consequences he faced or did not face for his actions. But I do know that in 1987, over 40 years after World War II ended, he came to the Eighth International Revisionist Conference organized by the Institute for Historical Revision to proclaim his everlasting love for Hitler and Nazism. He was 81 years old at the time and declared that Jewish people started World War II. He also thanked the IHR for its work and was applauded by them. The IHR still exists today and still promotes Holocaust denial. It now goes by the name Institute for Historical Review. Hi everyone, my name is Joe. Uh, I use he, him pronouns. And here we will be diving a bit deeper into today's modern fascism. Um, I'd like to start with a few quotes that I think will resonate well with that effort. Seeing the US where there are many Nazi organizations, K 
can't you see that fascism may come to us as it came in other countries? Can I sit by and wait until it is too late and there is no one I can call on for help? If I permitted such a time to come as a Jew and a progressive, I would be among the first to fall under the acts of the fascists. All I could do then would be to curse myself and say, why didn't I wake up when the alarm clock rang? So Katz here is calling out to all of us uh, a warning of what is to come without a measured effort against the rise of the fascist powers in Europe that had emigrated and begun to transform into this new American version. And now again, when we look at this metaphor, metamorphosis into today's iterations of fascism, I'm gonna bring back Robert Evans, I'm sorry, excuse me, Robert Paxton to quote from his 2004 book, Anatomy of Fascism. Fascism was an affair of the gut more than of the brain. And a study of the roots of fascism that treats only the thinkers and the writers misses the most powerful impulses of all. And that ultimately is what we intend to address here today. So as we've seen from Germany and Italy and has been noted by a number of historians, fascism is not an overnight transformation. Instead, it goes through a number of phases. Uh, Paxton, again in Anatomy of Fascism, notes fascism occurring in five cycles. First, creating a movement. Second, rooting in the political system. Then seizure of power. Then exercise of power. And finally, what is referred to as, quote, the long duration, where the fascist regime chooses either radicalization or entropy. Now, while we won't be doing a particularly deep dive on these cycles themselves, the relevance of phases in the growth of fascism is worth considering when we talk about this modern version. Fundamentally, the practices and methods used by modern fascists have not changed much from their origins in Europe. But practically, the tactics employed have become, to some extent, more subtle. And this makes differentiating the dedicated members of these neo-fascist groups from people who are just sympathetic, extremely difficult. And this is not by accident. Today's fascists have learned and adapted to help mainstream their ideologies through microaggressions and dog whistles, many of which have also not changed from the time of Camp Siegfried and earlier, whether it be stoking fear of the city, speaking of law-abiding citizens, what have you. Now, where we have gotten to in these phases listed above is a matter of discussion that, again, for the purposes of this teaching, we won't be going much further into. Now, because meme culture is such an important factor in far-right radicalization, it's often not taken seriously, which is very similar to the fascist roads to power that we saw in Europe, viewed as being led by silly men like Hitler or Mussolini. Another similarity is the lack of popular, popular elections, as we saw earlier. Anonymous messaging boards like 4chan and 8chan serve as important sources of red pilling, though 8chan maybe is more influ influential later on in the process. But for those who don't know, red pilling is the term intended to mean converting someone to fascist, racist, and anti-Semitic beliefs sometimes all three, uh, based off the movie, The Matrix, when the main character is given the choice between a red pill, which will open their eyes to the reality of a machine dominated world and a blue pill, which will return them to ignorance and safety. Like we said, it's a lot of silly stuff. So cut to personalities like Alex Jones or Steven Crowder, Ben Shapiro, Dave Rubin, Jordan Peterson, Andy Ngo, and other prominent far right social media ideologues these are all further examples of sources of red pills, bringing it easily to the masses through their podcast platforms or on Facebook or on Twitter, on YouTube. And then once red pilled, this can lead people further down the rabbit hole into darker corners. And that's where we see communities build among the far right on places like HN's poll board or on Telegram, on Gab. And we, as we all know, since January 6th, Parler. And these are just the well-known avenues for people to go down. There are many more. Most recently, with the isolation and inherent social fear caused as a result of COVID-19, many people who may have casually browsed for memes normally, or found camaraderie among shit posters, or maybe even just been salt-hearted for a good conspiracy theory, have been radicalized at a much faster rate due to increased time spent online in forums, on social media, and consuming more news than they otherwise would. Uh, COVID also has an ability to pull in tastes of eco-fascism into the conversation, 
with talk of letting those most vulnerable fall to the disease in order to preserve the Republic, becoming part of the mainstream dialogue. Now, the takeaway from all this is that these ideas are not just consumed and absorbed by some strangers far away, but by people within our own communities. And this isn't supposed to scare you or make you cautious of your neighbors. The intention here is to bring these signs to your attention, to make you aware that these people exist, even on a spectrum. In our next section, we'll discuss the more extreme end of that spectrum. These are the far right and fascist leaning threats that we'll be discussing today. Uh, these groups um, are either active or have been active until recently, but this is not an exhaustive list. Uh, the Ku Klux Klan comes to mind among other groups that are left out here. Other groups like the Oath Keepers who met with Lee Zeldin a few years ago the same Lee Zeldin who just recently announced his bid for governor. We have the Loud Majority and the Setauket Patriots, or as they were recently renamed, the Spy Coast Patriots. Um, they're at the lighter end of the spectrum, and then we're moving on to the Proud Boys and more overt white supremacist and fascist groups like Patriot Front. But before we move on to the next slide, a trigger warning. The next slide contains a picture of Loud Majority using a sign that subtly mocks transgender people. It's a large sign, or it's a large group of them huddled around the sign, and the sign says, we identify as a group of 10 people or, or less. Um, please consider walking away for a minute if that's too much to handle right now. So as Tim said, the first group we'll be discussing is the Long Island Loud Majority. Uh, they were founded in September, 2020 by West Babylon's own Sean Faresh. And they identify themselves as what they call constitutional conservatives and are proponents of Trump and pretty much all things MAGA. Uh, they regularly post live streams discussing popular mainstream conservative talking points, such as whether systemic racism is still a thing, uh, the benefits of voter ID laws, vaccine passports, uh, things along those lines. Their main push has been organizing large caravans across the island supporting Trump's 2020 campaign, Back the Blue, and most recently their new MAGA rally, which uh, has been postponed uh, several times so far because of weather. Uh, they, knew, they now uh, define MAGA as, quote, make Andrew go away, referring to Andrew Cuomo. Uh, they also attended the January 6th Stop the Steal rally, bringing about 300 people with them. And it's unclear whether they were actually involved in the actual uh, insurrection portion of that day. And Farash has also stated that the group doesn't quote, condone political violence. Uh, in watching their social media content and website, it would seem this group is more on the conservative alt-light end of the political spectrum, mainly sticking to the same talking points you might run into on Fox News or the New York Post and act more in a catalytic way for more intense fascist groups. Uh, where people who fall to a more center-right place in the political spectrum may find some solace. Another group along the same lines, like I mentioned previously, is the Sasaki Patriots. Uh, although they are now going by the name Spy Coast Patriots, we saw on Telegram, uh, Spy Coast referring to George Washington's spy ring during the American War for Independence. Um, they don't have much of a political ideology besides wanting a haircut during the early part of the pandemic, but the founder, James Robitsek here, is a former NYPD officer who was indicted for soliciting sex from a sex worker who was in his custody. He was indicted for sexual misconduct and official misuse of his position as an officer. The Setauket Patriots came to our attention during the pandemic as they began protesting for the economy to open up. Um, during the 2020 presidential election, they were another group that held some driving caravan events. And during one of them, one driver hit a protester with their vehicle. We'll be promoting the protesters GoFundMe in an email after the presentation. And on January 6th, they also brought an estimated 300 people with them to Washington, DC. Something that sets them apart though is ironic for their lack of ideology, but they ran someone for public office. Jim Griffin uh, was a candidate for Setauket Fire Commissioner. Uh, Mr. Griffin did not win the election. In fact, he lost badly, but he did run. 
And I think we all know these guys. Uh, these are the Proud Boys. Uh, we probably know these group from their black and yellow Fred Perry polo based uniform and their sizable media attention, both in street demonstrations slash fist fights and from their direct involvement in both the planning of the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, the Portland protests uh, or counter protests alongside Patriot Prayer and the actual confirmed evidence of them uh, participating in the January 6th siege or insurrection. Recently, the Southern Poverty Law Center added a chapter of Proud Boys to their hate map in St. James. So they are definitely something we wanna keep an eye on and be aware of. And uh, for a little background, they were officially founded in September, 2016 by Gavin McGinnis, though McGinnis had already been a well-established white nationalist by that point, writing for vdare.com in 2005, a white supremacist online publication, and had long pushed the line in that direction while he was a founding member of Vice Magazine, uh, with whom he no longer is associated due to what he considers uh, creative differences. The Southern Poverty Law Center notes that both white nationalists and neo-Nazis themselves had pointed to McGinnis as a gateway to the alt-right. The group cites itself as a pro-West fraternal organization whose members at the first of their four levels of membership identify as, quote, Western chauvinists. But of course, like most fascists, the ideologies in the Proud Boys is inherently contradictory and strategically self-serving. Uh, and just another content warning here, as I'll be describing a few of those ideologies in some detail. Uh, first, they are explicitly pro-white supremacy, though they will allow people of any ethnicity, sex, or creed to join, so long as they can make the claim that they make their first degree of membership uh, with the phrase, I am a Western chauvinist, and I refuse to apologize for creating the modern world. Currently, their chairman is Enrique Tarrio, who is of Afro, uh, excuse me, Afro-Cuban descent and was formerly the leader of their Miami chapter. Here's a perfect example of uh, my last point and played out in real life. Uh, they are also explicitly anti-feminist. Though they embrace a separate female group, group known as, tellingly, the Proud Boys Girls, which claims to be made up of the wives, girlfriends, and cheerleaders of Proud Boys and the Fraternal Order of Alt Knights, which I'll get into later. This separate group serves as a way to show that they accept women, even while they are used only by association of, of their male counterparts in a more subservient role. Of course, as McGinnis would put it, women are happier when they stay home and have children, end quote. And of course, they are explicitly violent, even as they claim to be opposed to what they call senseless violence, while also saying they don't, quote, start fights, we finish them. The group also runs a tactical defense arm through Kyle Chapman's Fraternal Order of Alt Knights, which operates as a paramilitary organization within the Proud Boys. Kyle Chapman, you may remember from his role in the beating of an anti-fascist counter-protester with a stick at the March 2017 March for Trump rally in Berkeley, California, gaining him the moniker Based Stick Man. And there would later be a whole story of a proposed coup by Chapman to reform the group to an outright white supremacist group in 2020. Uh, but this seems to have been ultimately unsuccessful uh, as Tario is still the chairman of the organization. Uh, Proud Boys are in the big leagues as far as the alt-right is concerned, if you consider their associations, though the more extreme far-right groups tend to consider them more of the alt-right. Uh, they regularly associate with groups like the now defunct white supremacists Identity Europa, the Rise Above Movement, or RAM, Oath Keepers, Hammerskins, uh, of course, Patriot Prayer, as I mentioned earlier, and others. Uh, their members have a tendency to also splinter and form other white nationalist, neo-Nazi racist groups like the Vinlinder Social Club when they determine the Proud Boys aren't extreme enough for their own likings. And as of 2018, they are officially recognized as a hate group by the FBI and most recently by the Canadian government for their actions on January 6th. Okay, on the left here, we have the chairman of the Proud Boys, Enrique, holding the microphone uh, with a local Long Island musician who goes by the stage name Ethelhalm. And on the right, we have a flyer that Suffolk DSA became aware of on the Long Island Proud Boys Telegram chat. Um, the flyer was made up by the artist, we assume, um, for a show that they had supposedly booked at Shaker's Pub. We found that Shaker's Pub denied booking the show and had no idea about the event. 
a Suffolk DSA anti-fascist organizer went to the bar and saw that the Proud Boys did in fact try to bully their way onto the stage. The picture on the left shows three Proud Boys cornering the bar owner. And on the right side, we have a small portion of the crowd of Proud Boys who showed up to the event. Ethafoam is the second from the right. There were about 20, 25 Proud Boys who showed up to this bar, Shakers Pub in Oakdale, in the snow, in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, however active they are, we aren't sure, but they can mobilize for a show on Long Island. Now we're gonna shift into the more extreme end of the right. Uh, and these groups are more specifically legitimate neo-Nazi white supremacy hate groups. Uh, Patriot Front up first is a, oh, I'm sorry, we uh, did exclude a, a group later on. So I apologize for my misstatement there. Uh, Patriot Front, is a white supremacy group started by Thomas Rousseau of Texas after splintering off of the group Vanguard America, most infamously known for their actions on the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville in 2017, where anti-racist activist Heather Heyer was killed by one of its members, though they would later claim he was not a member of their organization. Uh, Rousseau was 18 years old at the time and would start Patriot Front shortly thereafter. The Southern Poverty Law Center describes them as, quote, an image obsessed organization that rehabilitated the explicitly fascist agenda of Vanguard America with garish patriotism. Patriot Front focuses on theatrical rhetoric and activism that can be easily distributed as propaganda for its chapters across the country. Now, Thomas Rousseau is a prime example of the online message board radicalization we discussed earlier. Rousseau is an avid follower of and red-pilled by the, the site, which is now offline, ironmarch.org a fascist online forum that openly shared neo-Nazi ideology. It's notable to mention Iron March was also the launching point for other notable hate groups, including Adam Waffen Division, another explicitly neo-Nazi group hoping to, quote, work towards civilizational collapse by way of leaderless terror cells. Along those lines, Patriot Front's tactics diverge widely from groups like the Proud Boys, who will often collaborate with other hate groups, and instead, according to the SPLC's Hate Watch group, prefer, quote, to decline to participate in large rallies with other hate groups, preferring instead to work with small local chapters that allow Patriot Front to remain the center of attention while controlling their message and presentation. Patriot Front rarely makes explicit appearances at all, though when they do, the appearances are highly organized with members dressed in a uniform of either khaki slacks or cargo pants and blue hoodies or jackets with usually some sort of white face covering. Uh, Rousseau will often not co be covering his face for propaganda and advertising purposes, uh, when he does attend, that is. The group would carry flags bearing the Black Sun logo in their early days, which is a lesser known, well, uh, excuse me, a lesser well-known Nazi symbol, uh, but now carry a more patriotic flag bearing their own logo in place of the stars on the American flag, and that seems to have taken its place. Instead of regular physical appearances, they will often post up flyers around areas in order to boost recruitment by promoting their activism. They've also gone as far as draping large banners over Black Lives, Black Lives Matter billboards bearing their own slogan, Reclaim America. Now, recently on Long Island, flyers like the one above on the left were found in multiple locations around Port Jefferson. SPLC has a map of flyerings for hate, from hate groups across the country for 2020. And as you can see, Patriot Front easily has the largest number of them, with sightings having been found in Texas, Maryland, Florida, California, South Carolina, Connecticut, Kansas, Delaware, Pennsylvania, of course, New York. Um, in Pennsylvania recently, in Pittsburgh, uh, this past February, there was a large action from the organization with Thomas Rousseau in attendance to contest the 2020 presidential election uh, the entire thing was filmed and used as propaganda on their website. Now, as you can see from this map, there are still more groups we have not discussed, and they are just being pointed out for flyering, let alone any other physical activity. From the year, it's up to everyone how they are allowed to grow. So we've talked about a lot of upsetting history and current information, but I don't want you to leave here hopeless. I hope you are wondering what you can do to oppose these organized fascists. 
If you can remember back to all of the moments I discussed in our local fascist past, there were always anti-fascists there. There were 100,000 people outside the Nazi rally at MSG and only 20,000 people inside. There are more of us than there are of them, but we need to be as organized as they are. This does not mean everyone needs to meet these people on the streets and brawl with them. Although if that's your cup of tea, I will not stop you. You can fight fascism by using methods that make the jobs of fascists harder. So that can mean spreading information, let people know who these fascists are, make their dog whistles clear so they can't hide behind them. This can also be providing mutual aid, building a strong community and connections with your neighbors so you're in communication if these fascists come to town. And don't do this alone. Join a group and push for change together that supports the people most vulnerable to fascist attacks. Of course, I'm biased and I want you to join Suffolk DSA or NASA DSA if you're over the county line. Um, but the group you join can be you and your neighbors, your coworkers, your faith community, etc. I know it can feel overwhelming to start. So we've compiled a list of local mutual aid networks you can plug into. Due to our time constraint, I unfortunately won't be able to go into detail about all of the necessary work all these groups are doing, but please take some of your own time to check them out and support their efforts if you're able to. I'll give you a couple minutes to note these down, but you can absolutely follow up with us about any of them after the presentation to learn more. And if you registered, you will be receiving a PDF of this slide, as well as our work cited, further reading, um, et cetera, to your email. And I have one final suggestion for you. Uh, if you can make it, our comrades at NYC DSA Anti-Fascists are hosting an open salon tomorrow at 7.30 PM. A salon is a space for people to have discussions and share ideas. It will be virtual. And if you're interested, you can RSVP by emailing them at nycdsaantifascists at protonmail.com. And if you can't come tomorrow, don't worry. We do this every single month. Follow them on social media to stay updated. So now that we've shared this all with you, um, we wanna know what actions will you take to uh, organize against these fascists. And you can choose multiple answers and there's no right or wrong answer. <laughs> okay, uh, this makes me really happy. I see a lot of you saying you're gonna share what you've learned today. You're gonna do some mutual aid, uh, join some groups, uh, see some of you are gonna come to the salon tomorrow. So I'm excited to see you there. Uh, thank you for participating in the poll. Okay, now as promised, here is um, here are some of our works cited um, that we used in preparation for this presentation. It is not exhaustive, but if you want to learn more about anything we touched here, touched on here today, this is where you start. Uh, if you registered for the presentation, these slides will be emailed to you. These are the two videos that we used and where you can find them. and some further anti-fascist reading that we think you'd be interested in if you find this topic interesting. Again, it's not exhaustive uh, and most are either freely available online or from your local public library. Support your libraries. And that's all for the presentation today. I wanna to thank everybody for um, taking the time to come out and join us. I hope you found this um, informative and uh, it gives you uh, some new perspective on what's going on on Long Island. Um, so we're going to have a Q&A session. Um, but before that, we're going to play one last song for you as a little bit of a cool down um, for anybody who has to go. And uh, we will have a recording of the entire webinar on our social media pages um, soon. Uh, for those who are interested in the Q&A section, our moderators will be collecting your questions, um, or if you've asked any that have not been answered yet, they 
we will be answering them now. Um, so if you are staying for the Q&A and you have any questions, feel free to submit them now and we'll have uh, 30 minutes for the Q&A section. So thank you all for coming again and enjoy the music. <laughs>